Well, this morning we're going to uh, look at the subject of five countries and ten cities. And uh, glean, I hope, a little bit about uh, God's will and purposes and desires for us uh, as a church even here in North America. So it was the second Sunday in August that uh, we hopped on a plane early in the morning here in Saskatoon and we went from uh, Saskatoon uh, to Toronto and uh, spent a good chunk of the day in Toronto and then we went from Toronto all the way over to Moscow and once we were in Moscow we spent a week there uh, ministering at the General Conference of the Assemblies of God uh, for Russia and the Ukraine. Ukraine. We left uh, Russia and flew late Saturday afternoon to Delhi in India. I uh, had a stop over there and then spent the night on the plane uh, going to Calcutta which uh, the Indian folks now call Kolkata or something like that. Anyhow, they've changed the spelling of it. Uh, we were in uh, Kolkata for uh, two wonderful days of ministry. And then we went to Jaipur. Jaipur is the uh, city that uh, the British monarchy uh, regarded as kind of their home within the nation of India. They have palaces there. They would send their children and family there for holidays. Just a beautiful city uh, in the nation of India. We ministered there at the, I thought I was going to a pastor's retreat. I got there and they announced that I'm speaking at the 64th General Conference of North India Assemblies of God when I got there. So it was a little bigger than I was expecting. Uh, but the Lord was gracious and, and ministered. Uh, as we were in Jaipur. Then we left Jaipur, flew back to Delhi uh, for a stopover, went from Delhi to Kuala Lumpur, stayed overnight in Kuala Lumpur, uh, Malaysia, went to uh, Maidan, Indonesia, where we spent the weekend in ministry. Then we flew back to Kuala Lumpur, where we attended the Pentecostal World Conference. And then we left Kuala Lumpur and went to Beijing, uh, for what we was supposed to be a holiday, but keeping up with those wonderful Chinese people and the pace they live was uh, absolutely exhausting. That's a culture that just goes, 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 goes. Uh, we left Beijing and went to uh, Lucas Zhang's home city. Lucas has lived with us for uh, the last uh, almost five years now, and uh, he was home on holidays, so he toured us in his home city for uh, three or so days, then we flew to Vancouver and came home. So we were on 15 flights in uh, 26 days. And uh, I, that doesn't sound exhausting when you say it, um, but it's exhausting when you do it. And to those of you who have uh, flown, you realize that airlines tend to want you to wake up at 2 in the morning to get to the airport at 5 a.m. or something. So it was just... Uh, really uh, an exhausting stretching time but God did such uh, wonderful and special things and so I'm going to tell you five stories uh, this morning from uh, those journeys and the first one is a story from scripture and I'm going to read it to you in a moment but let me give you a little background on this I was sitting Having left Moscow, I was sitting in the airport in Delhi and uh, I was checking my emails because for the first uh, two and a half weeks I regarded myself as still working, so I needed to stay on top of things. I was checking my emails, opened them up, and one of them was from Murray Cornelius. Murray Cornelius was to be the uh, co-speaker with me at this uh, conference in Jaipur, and he said to me, uh, hey, John, I'm supposed to be speaking at the church in Calcutta tomorrow morning, uh, but I'm stuck here on the tarmac in uh, at Pearson International Airport in Toronto. Can you pinch hit for me in Calcutta? 
So I'm about to board the plane all night to, uh, to get to Calcutta. And uh, I said, yeah, I'll be happy to stand in for you, Murray. Arrived in Calcutta. We were picked up, drove quickly to a play, the home we'd be staying in uh, for a couple of nights, uh, showered, put on a suit, arrived at the service late. Now, during the night, while I was trying to stay awake, I was kind of sermonizing in my head, trying to, what do you want me to say, Lord? And I had this little idea of what I was going to get up and speak. I'm sitting on the platform. I'm going up to speak in about two minutes. And Holy Spirit says to me, wrong sermon, John. So I had two minutes in my heart to put together some thoughts about what the Lord was kind of downloading really, really quickly. And this is the portion of scripture uh, I got up to read and I preached from. And I'll read it to you now from Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14, beginning to read at uh, verse number 3. Mark chapter 14. And beginning at verse number three, while he was in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper and reclining at the table, there came a woman with an alabaster vial, a very costly perfume of pure nard, and she broke the vial and poured it over his head. But uh, some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume? For this perfume, verse number five, might have been sold for over 300 denarii and the money given to the poor. And they were scolding her, but Jesus said, leave her alone. Why do you bother her? She's done a good to deed to me, for you always have the poor with you. And whenever you wish, you can do good to them, but you do not always have me. She has done what she could. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for the burial. I want to point that one phrase out to you from verse number eight. She has done what she could. She has done what she could. The lady who broke her alabaster box of perfume and poured it over Jesus. People didn't like it, but Jesus said, she has done what she could. The Lord brought this scripture portion to me and I preached out of it in Calcutta that morning with about 90 seconds of notice. Uh, that said, after the service, uh, the daughter of the lady and her husband who started the church came up to me and said, I can't believe the Lord led you to that portion. Last night there was a couple in this church who were struggling with what they were supposed to do. And I told them, just break your alabaster box. Just break your alabaster box. She has done what she could. My question for us today is, are we doing what we can? This lady did what she could. We arrived in uh, India and... Uh, Upon arriving in India, we had the privilege of seeing the ministry in Calcutta, and uh, we had the privilege there of being a part of uh, a church that, next slide please, move forward, forward, forward. Oh, I guess I'm in Russia. Okay, we'll go back to Russia for my second story. We arrived, or our first place we landed was Moscow, and uh, that lady there, not a, a great picture, but uh, the best one I had of her. Um, she was a gymnast in the Olympics representing uh, the Soviet Union, and uh, we had the privilege of staying in her home for uh, four nights. And uh, I, I just want to talk a little bit about the commitment of this lady and 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 how we would respond. Pastor phones up and says, uh, would you house for a week uh, this couple from Canada? They only speak English. I know you only speak Russian, but would you invite them into your house for a week and look after them? She says, yes. Think about how uncomfortable that can be for a week. 
And she struggled for a week, and we struggled for a week, but she did her best. I'd get up in the morning, and she would explain what I'm having for breakfast. I would just nod my head and eat what she put in front of me. But she talked away like I was understanding her all week. God, in his gentleness and his kindness, while we were in uh, Russia, chose to move by his spirit. I was talking to pastors, and you know some of my convictions about some of the things that are important in ministry. One of them is we need to live disciplined lives. And, and I have a life principle that simply goes like this. Never go to bed the same day you have to get up. I believe that. Never go to bed the same day you have to get up. I believe we lead and serve best when we lead and serve from rest. So I got up and explained this to the Russians. And they, some of them nodded their head and some looked like they were mad at me. But uh, I explained that. And then God uh, pulled a trick on me and his spirit fell. And I was ministering at the altar till quarter after 1 and 1.30 at the night while I was in Russia. I wasn't getting to bed the same day, or I was getting up, going to bed the same day I had to get up. One night I left the altar. I've never experienced anything like this in my life. I've been praying for preachers for three and a half hours. Most of them were being slain in the spirit. I was praying with them for three and a half hours. And I didn't realize the exertion that I was experiencing, not only spiritually, but physically. And when it was all done and there was not a preacher left in the building to pray for, I said a quiet, thank you, Jesus. And then I looked down. I was wearing a gray suit jacket. My gray suit jacket, front and back, was dripping wet. My shirt was soaked. When it dried... I had salt lines all across the front and the back of it. Like I was really exerting myself physically and it was just exhausting. But I say all that to get to the point of this Russian lady who could not speak a word of English. When she made a commitment to host us, uh, she signed up not only to be up to make us breakfast at 7 a.m., but she was waiting at the altar till 1.30 in the morning because she was our host. Here's a woman who God is deeply pleased with because this woman did what she could. She did what she could. Let me tell you uh, a third story now. As we move on, it... Uh, looking at uh, some of the things that happened while we were on our trip. We arrived in uh, Jaipur, India. And uh, quite an experience. They checked us into the Marriott Hotel, the conference did. That uh, is the hotel room we stayed in for our days at the the general conference that is as fine a hotel as we have ever stayed in top class in absolutely every sense of the word we looked and I'd been to India before I could hardly believe it then we pulled black our blinds from our room and that was the view outside our window we were living in luxury and at six o'clock in the morning I took that picture about quarter to seven in the morning, six o'clock in the morning, these people who live in those little tents were up and uh, w starting fires so they could boil some water, so they could wash up for the day. They cooked on those outdoor fires. And that is how so much of the population lives in India. And I tell all of that story to take you to a guy named Bo. I wrote about him in Backwards about four weeks ago. Bo stuck out like a, a, uh, a, uh, a sore thumb uh, on a hand in that crowd in India. The Indian crowd was a beautiful group of Indians with their dark skin and dark hair and dark eyes. And here was Bo on the third row of this general conference, a 
blonde, like blonde, blonde, white blonde haired, blue eyed, uh, slender guy. And I went up and I introduced myself to him. And Bo said, I'm Bo. And I asked him where he's from. He said, I'm from the Netherlands. I'm from Holland. I said uh, he was uh, he was available to help me as I needed it. I I needed to get uh, hold on hold of some Indian money. I said, "Can you take me to a bank machine?" He said, "I'll drive you." When I was driving, when he was driving me to the bank, he told me his story. He's from the Netherlands. Did very well in business, so well in business that his company in Netherlands transferred him to uh, the state of Virginia, and. Um, put him in charge of their entire North American operations. Uh, he was flying all over North America, uh, responsible for hundreds of employees, making a six-figure salary, owning three cars, living in a big house, the white picket fence, a beautiful wife, good kids, and everything was going well, but something began to stir in his heart that there's more to life than owning a big house. There's more to life than making good money. There's more to life than what I'm doing. And he began to pray and say, God, what would you have me to do? I'll speed the story up a bit. And Bo uh, showed up in the nation of India after due process of about a couple of years. And he is in uh, the nation of North, in the se India, the North section of is known as North India, helping lead the charge to plant churches in North India. And this is the goal of the Assemblies of God, the North India part of uh, the Assemblies of God. After 1917, uh, by 2013, they had 1,600 pastors and leaders, 1,500 churches, and 15 Bible collages. Uh, by 2020, uh, their goal is to have 5,000 churches, 8,000 pastors, and 1,000 training centers. Here is a church that's moving forward. Here is a church with a dream and a vision for making a difference in North India. And I celebrate that. I celebrate that. But here's a young man, Bo and his wife, and four kids, the oldest one a 13-year-old girl, and they leave all the comforts of living in something like the Marriott Hotel that Donna and I was staying in to move in and amongst people who were living in tents that we saw outside of the window. And he gives his life for that kind of service. He was doing what he could to see the gospel go forward. The world is full of people who are living like that. The world is full of people who are living like that. We move on to the next story. We showed up in Kuala Lumpur. The first night we were in Kuala Lumpur, we were asked to attend the dedication service of the new Pentecostal church in Kuala Lumpur. I... Uh, was on time about five minutes before the service was to begin and uh, that's the best seat I could get. Um, sanctuary uh, seated 5,000 plus and every one of them was full. It's the story of a man who had a vision for making a difference in Kuala Lumpur and he said, I need help doing this, Dr. Cho, will you mentor me? And Dr. Cho mentored this pastor, and a great church has been built in Kuala Lumpur. If you know Dr. Cho, I heard him speak that morning. Dr. Cho has uh, built his ministry on three things. He's built his ministry on prayer. I told you what he said about prayer last Sunday morning if you were here. He was complaining to God about being called to the ministry. Uh, he was... Uh, dramatically healed from terminal tuberculosis when a Christian came to pray for him and when he was healed he left Buddhism to begin to serve Jesus and Jesus called him into pastoral ministry and he got into pastoral ministry and he said God I don't know what work to do and God said to him Dr. Cho don't work you pray and I'll work You pray, and I'll work. And in 2007, he was pastoring the largest church in the world with over, and yes, these statistics are right, with over one million members. You pray, I'll work. He says, I built this church on prayer. 
Number two, he built it on SAL groups. Now, SAL groups sell everywhere in the world except North America. And so we don't call them SAL groups in North America. We call them life groups. But he built it on small groups, on life groups. And third thing he said I built my ministry on was never touching the glory of God. Never touching the glory of God. I was praying some time ago and saying, God, why aren't we experiencing more of your glory in North America? And he said to me, John, there's still too many leaders who want glory for themselves. Still too many leaders who want to be noticed. Still too many leaders who want to be recognized as great and important. He said, we built our ministry on three things, praying, cell groups, and never touching the glory of God. I will never forget the honor of sitting under the ministry of Dr. Cho in Kuala Lumpur that evening. He said, I'm 78 years of age. I've retired now. He's left this church of one million members. I think that would be pretty hard to resign from. But he's retired from leading this church of one million members. He's been retired for a couple of months. He stands in front of this vast audience in Kuala Lumpur and he says, I'm taking this time to pray and see what God would have me to do. And God said to me, he's 78, God said to me, uh, Dr. Cho, you have two choices. Uh, your first choice is you can just retire. If you retire, I'll take you to heaven. You might as well come be with me. Or you can plant a church, and then I'll let you live to be a hundred. So Dr. Cho said, I'm deciding where I want to go, and uh, I'm taking this time to see what I'm supposed to do. Dr. Cho is a man who has done what he could. He's prayed. <laughs> He's done what he could. What, a, what, a, what an honor and what a privilege to have been in Kuala Lumpur. Next slide, please. Take you back now to uh, Calcutta. When we arrived at Calcutta, uh, we walked outside of the airport, not really knowing for sure who would be picking us up. But there was this uh, white guy outside the airport with this big, broad smile that he was directing towards Don and I when we left uh, the airport in Calcutta. And he was holding a bouquet of flowers. And he walked straight towards us and presented Donna with the bouquet of flowers and said, Hi, my name is Stu Shaw. And he said, uh, You're going to be staying with us. He drove us to his place. And uh, this picture is taken right outside his place where he and his wife, Monique, live. Uh, we can look at the next picture as well. No, let's go back. Sorry, I thought I had two of those. Back, back, back. Thank you. Um, we are going in uh, to his house to shower to go minister at the church in Calcutta. We minister his wife, meet his wife, Monique. He told me his story on the drive across Calcutta to his house. Here's a man who was born in Ireland. And uh, as a... I think it was early teens, his parents moved to the Toronto area. He had a job as a, uh, as a mailman delivering for their postal service. Uh, Toronto has milder weather than Saskatoon. Good job, steady job, paid well. But as he entered uh, his late 30s, there was this unease in his spirit and his heart. He says, there's got to be more to life than walking around Toronto and dropping pieces of paper in mailboxes. God, what would you have me to do? 
And he said, are you willing to go where I'd ask you to go? Are you willing to do what I'd ask you to do? And Stu and Monique talked about it and they said yes. And an opportunity came to explore uh, Calcutta. He flew over to himself. He said, if I bring my wife, she'll say no, I'm sure. So he went himself and he looked it over and phoned back and tried to paint as good a picture of Calcutta as he could. Calcutta is one of the poorest cities in our world. She said, I'll go. God's calling us to go. And uh, Stu and Monique have given their lives to ministering in Calcutta, India. And they're making a difference because they're doing what they can. We ministered there Sunday morning, uh, s tried to sleep Sunday afternoon and recover a bit. Monday morning they announced to us that Donna was speaking. I underlined that. Donna was speaking to a group of ladies on Monday morning. These were ladies that they have reached out to and they have ministered to. They called them the King's Gems. Every one of these women, there were about 14 of them around the table. Every one of these women were uh, set free and delivered from working the streets. They were prostitutes. And Stu and Monique went out and began to love them and now every morning, Monday to Friday, they come to uh, the facility they live in and they have devotions. And Donna was leading the devotions with these ladies that morning. And then they go and they make jewelry all day and they sell the jewelry and that's how they're supporting them. God has redeemed these ladies from the street because... God has redeemed these ladies from the street because a mailman in Toronto was willing to say yes and give up the comfort and luxury of culture in this particular part of the world. He was willing to give it up and he went across the ocean and he worked in the poorest city in the world to see some ladies redeemed from the destructive power of sin. They did what they could. Story uh, doesn't end there. They uh, lead ch uh, homes for children across uh, the outskirts of Calcutta. And uh, there's a couple of pictures of uh, our visit to those homes out in, in Calcutta. They have taken kids who literally lived in the train station. Their parents had deserted them and they lived in the train station because it was warm and it was covered and they begged for food and when people left some food sitting on, on, uh, on stools or benches they took that food and they ate it. That's how they were living and some of the, uh, because of the lifestyle young girls as young as eight and nine and ten began to sell themselves because that's how they could live and uh, Stu and Monique said we can do something about this and they began to buy property and they took property and they began to house these kids who used to be living in the train station and they took redeemed prostitutes and they made them the home mothers of these kids whose lives were on a straight path to poverty and pain because here is a couple who were doing what they could story doesn't end there. We went to the 11th or 12th story of a beautiful office facility that Mark Buntain, and I wish I had time to tell Mark's story today, but Mark was pastoring in Watrous, and then he went and pastored in Moose Jaw here in Saskatchewan, and God called him to Calcutta. And when he was in Calcutta, he was thinking years ahead of his time. He said, this city needs office buildings, and he raised money to build this huge 11-story office structure, and from the rent of the office buildings in this 11 office office story structure their ministry is being paid for. Well on the 11th story of this office building, Stu said you've got to come up here and see the newest thing God has called me to do. And they've only got an office door at this point and they've got the name on the office door. But he's starting a teen challenge ministry for drug and alcoholic addiction in Calcutta, India. Here is a couple who are doing what they could. And the Holy Spirit would say to all of us this morning, the Holy Spirit would say to all of us this morning are we doing what we can are we doing what we can 
I take you now to a portion of scripture from Philippians chapter 3. I'm going to read it to you out of the message today. Yes, all the things I once thought were so important are gone from my life. Compared to the high privilege of knowing Christ Jesus as my master firsthand, everything I once thought I had going for me is insignificant. Dog dung. I've dumped it all in the trash so that I could embrace Christ and be embraced by him. I didn't want some petty, inferior brand of righteousness that comes from listing, keeping a list of rules when I could get the robust kind that comes from trusting Christ, God's righteousness. Paul says there came a time in my life when I left everything else behind and all the stuff I was doing and I counted it as dog dung because there was something greater I could be doing with my life. I picked the reading up in verse number 12. Now, I'm not saying that I have this all together, that I have it made, but I'm well on my way reaching out for Christ who has so wondrously reached out for me. Friends, don't get me wrong. By no means do I count myself an expert in all of this, but I've got my eye on the goal where God is beckoning us onward to Jesus. I'm on off and running and I'm not turning back and so today the question God would have for the people of God at Lawson is are you off and running or have you turned your back from the high call God has put on your life are you doing what you can a hey, uh a couple of months ago, I finished doing some premarital counseling. I, uh, Evan does a lot of marriages in this uh, city from his work contacts through work in the Chamber of Contra- Co- uh, Commerce. And he doesn't mind doing the wedding. He says, but Dad, I have nothing to say yet in premarital counseling, so I get to do the premarital counseling. and. I'm honored to do it. The last couple I did premarital counseling with uh, for Evan gave me a gift certificate to a bookstore. I think Evan told them how to make me happy. And on Friday I went and bought some books. And the first book I was reading through had this uh, quote in it from Uh, Clifford Nass of Stanford University. Let me read it to you. He's talking about how our brains are beginning to work in our culture. The neural circuits devoted to scanning, skimming, and multitasking are expanding and strengthening, while those used for reading and thinking deeply with sustained concentration are weakening and eroding. What he's saying is we're getting our brain developed really well so uh, we can do quite a few things at once, but we're losing the ability to really get concentrated on one thing. I read down in his quotes, and this is what it said a little ways down. Habitual multitaskers may be sacrificing performance on the primary task, they are suckers for irrelevancy. They are suckers for irrelevancy. I want to apply the quote now, if I could. Here's the problem in our culture. We get really, really good at doing a lot of things. We're juggling and we're multitasking and we're giving a little bit of attention to a lot of things and often making no significant difference in anything. The people who make a difference in the world are people who have identified what they are called of God to do 
and they give their heart and their soul and their energy to do it. I'm asking you the question today, are you doing what you can? Are you doing what God has asked you to do? Or have you fallen into a trap of just becoming a potential sucker for irrelevancy? These people, these stories I told today, beginning with the lady who broke her alabaster box. These stories I've told you today are stories of people who were doing what they could. You want to be a part of a church, I want to be part of serving in a church that is doing what they can. So we have the potential, the opportunity, the door in front of us in the month of October to again expand the ministry of Lawson and we're going into Martinsville and we want to launch large in Martinsville on October 20th. We want to go into Martinsville and make a difference in that community. What a great story there, the city of Martinsville with the blessing and approval of the principal of Venture Heights School has said come in Sunday morning and you can have church here. Use the building as if it is your own. And you know what? They, they trust us so much and they hardly know us. They trust us so much they've already given us a key to the school we yeah <laughs> we can go there on Sunday morning open the doors disarm the alarm system and go and use that building to make a difference in Martinsville thank God but it calls all of us to perhaps explore and examine our hearts and say Lord what are you calling me to do? I know it's kind of neat to come into a gathering like this on Sunday morning. It's comfortable. It's familiar. There's a certain mass of people, and there won't be a mass of people in Martinsville to start. It'll come. It'll come. It came on Saturday night. It'll come in Martinsville, too. This is comfortable, but maybe God is calling some of us to say, you know, seeing the kingdom go forward, seeing the kingdom advance is more important to me than my own comfort level. And, and I want to be a part of seeing the work in Martinsville go forward. I want to be a part of the kingdom being extended in Martinsville. We need some families who will say we'll, we'll go the first six weeks just to help things get off the ground. We need others who say maybe the Lord is calling me to be a part of that church and I don't ask anybody to go. I just ask everybody to pray about whether they're supposed to go. I don't want all of you to go. This is still important. But what is God calling us to do? We especially need musicians. And we especially need children's workers. And we especially need people who, <laughs> once we turn the key on Sunday morning, can help us turn the gym into a sanctuary and then return it to the condition it was in after the service. Pray. Pray for what God would have us to do in Martinsville. And let's make sure as a church, for the sake of the kingdom and for the glory of God, that we are doing what we can. That we are doing what we can. In this church, this Sunday morning worship experience, there are still areas we need significant workers and laborers. If you can get involved, we'd encourage you to get involved because we need workers and God is honored and God is glorified when we do what we can. Would you stand across this sanctuary? We're going to take time to respond to what the Holy Spirit would want to be saying just today. This service is not dismissed. If you need to go, please go quietly and reverently, but this service is not dismissed. We need to take time to allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us. As we experience worship for a few moments here, would you just say to the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, lead me, show me, show me, show me what you would have me to be doing. Let's all be a people who are doing what we can. Let's all be a people who are doing what we can.